Welcome, everybody. You're in Lagoon K. Our next talk is the remote Butler did it with Tal Baedri and Haim Hoch. I've got a couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you haven't already, stop by the business hall on the first level in Bayside AB. A lot of, a lot of great vendors in there. They'd love to talk to you. Uh, the Black Hat Arsenal is on the third level. If you haven't made it up there, it's uh, just past the escalators. Um, a lot of neat stuff in the arsenal. And there'll also be a reception up there at 1700. And then if you haven't picked up your merchandise in the Black Hat Swag Store or the bookstore, um, that's also, uh, today's the last day for that. That's uh, on level two here as well. Uh, if you haven't put your phone on silent yet, please do that so you don't interrupt the presentation. And I'll leave it to these guys. So thank you for the, uh, the introduction. Our talk today, the remote butler did it. I'm Tal Berry. I lead the research team of the Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics product, and Chaim Hoch, researcher in the team. And let's start with a quick warm-up question. So what is missing in this painting? Anyone knows? Kind of obvious. Well, obviously, they didn't take the laptop to breakfast. And which is quite unfortunate because an evil maid may enter to their hotel room and get access to their computer. But you say, this is a bunch of, they look uh, tech savvy. They probably have uh, passwords for their computers and they understand the, the threat and they may also have a hardware encrypted uh, hard drive. So the attacker cannot simply just take the hard drive and mount it in a, another computer. So, so they're good. They can enjoy their breakfast, right? Or aren't they? And let's see this video, and we will understand it uh, afterwards. And this is an attack uh, demonstrated by Ian Hacken uh, last year on Black Hat Europe. And let's see. So let's see the video. Just a sec. Okay, so we have here uh, some device, a Raspberry Pi, we don't know what it is. And there is a laptop here. Ian will show he doesn't know the password. You enter A and get password is wrong. And then Ian connects that device into the network interface, enters A again. But now it's prompted to change his password. So it changes from A to B. Password is being changed. Disconnects the device. Press enter and wait, 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 wait. And he's in. So very clever attack. And I think Ian is here in the crowd. So Hi, Ian. So I think you deserve a round of applause for that attack. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. And so what are we going to talk today? Chaim will start by uh, analyzing the evil made attack and telling you all the technical details behind it. Also, there are some general lessons here about uh, the logon mechanics in the Windows, how it, does it behave in, uh, in the presence of domain controller with Kerberos, the cache credential me mechanism for uh, when a domain controller is not accessible and the change password mechanism. Then we will present our new contribution, the remote malicious butler attack, which even made is very cool, but it requires physical access of the attacker. As we've seen, it would be so much more uh, useful for the attacker if they can launch that attack from a uh, network access and not physical access. And we will show this is uh, possible and how it fits into a uh, attacker's cyber kill chain model. And hopefully if the demo god permits, we'll do a li live demo of it. And we would conclude with some solutions to both our attack and the original even made attack of patching, hardening, and defense in depth. So with that, I pass to Chaim. Thank you very much. You here? Um, okay, so we'll be talking about the evil made attack. Uh, the term was first coined by Joanna Rutkowska in 2009. Uh, the same scenario that Tal talked about. You leave your laptop in a hotel room and go to breakfast, and meanwhile, an evil maid 
enters your room, has physical access to your computer, and can do whatever she wants. So um, there are two doors to the, uh, to the machine. The first one is the password. If there's no password, you can just log on and do whatever you want. And uh, backdoor, the hard drive. If the hard drive is not encrypted, you can just mount it on, a, on a, another computer, copy all the data, and you're good. So the original attack was um, getting the encrypted key for the encrypted hard drive and decrypting it. And Ian's attack was to bypass the password. Uh, it was a attack that was presented last year in Black Hat Europe, and we'll go into that attack. So to understand the attack, we have to understand Kerberos and Windows authentication. All right, so first of all, thanks to Benjamin Dilpe for the graphics. Um, and now we'll talk about Kerberos. All right, so Kerberos is a network protocol which does authentication and authorization in a network. The main controller is the main source of trust in uh, the Kerberos environment. There are three different types of entities, the domain controller, users, and servers or services. Each one has its own set, set of keys. We'll uh, discuss the user keys and the server keys. So how does it work? A user, when he wants to log on, he enters his password into the computer. This password is then hashed into different keys uh, from different encryption suites, such as AES, RC4, and so forth. He then requests uh, something that's called uh, TGT from the domain controller. This is done by encrypting uh, time, a timestamp with his key. The DC then gets the request, which is called a AS request, and tries to decrypt it with the keys. Uh, the DC has the keys for all the users and for all the servers. So if the key is correct, uh, he will success successfully decrypt the timestamp, and if it matches, then he will give the TGT, the ticket granting ticket, to uh, the user. Whenever a user wants to uh, gain access to a service in the network, he'll um, pass this TGT to the domain controller and ask for a specific service. The domain controller will then create a service ticket to that requested service, which will be encrypted with the services key. He will then give that service key to the user. Since it's encrypted with the services key, the user will not be able to manipulate it. And the user will pass this ser service key to, um, to the server, who will then be able to decrypt it and give the service to the user. All right, so domain logon is a special case of uh, a resource access. In our case, the resource is the target uh, computer, and the, the service name is host slash the machine name. As you can see on the right, there is an AS request um, from our auto server, and the service that it looks for is, that it wants, is host and our auto server. So it's the same name. Since we said that every service has its own ticket, this means that our host computer, the computer itself, has a, tick, uh, pa uh, has a password as well. So this is called the machine key or the computer account key, computer password, they're all the same. Um, once the, uh, the user has the, the computer key or the computer key is validated, uh, this creates something that we call a domain trust relationship. This means that the domain controller knows the correct computer key. All right. So we've talked, about, we've talked about authentication in the network environment. What happens if a user takes his computer home and isn't connected anymore to a domain controller. So in this case, we have something that's called cache credentials. When a user initially logs on, his password is hashed into a cache credential entry. This cache credential, uh, cache credential entry is stored in the registry on the hard drive and is, the, is stored in a format that's called MS Cache uh, 2, which you can see here is a PBKDF2 of uh, the password and the user. Their iteration number is 10,240. Uh, 10, um, and this is stored in the registry. Now, this is hard to crack, also because of the uh, number of iterations and the salt of the user, and it isn't reusable. You can't steal these cache credentials, transfer them to another computer, uh, and use them. So whenever a user logs on, and he's not in a domain environment, the cache, cache credential is, is calculated and is checked against 
what, uh, what is stored in the registry. If they are matched, then the user gains access to the computer. The last thing that we'll need to know about is what happens when a password is expired. So uh, if a user is connected to a domain controller and he tries to uh, gain access to the, to the machine by asking for an AS request, if the password has been expired, the domain controller will then reply with a Kerberos error of uh, curb 5 KDC error key expired. You can see it right here on the right. And will then prompt the change password process. The user will enter the old password, which will then, then be used to transfer the new password to the domain controller. Once the new password uh, has gone to the domain controller, he will update his keys and will let the user log on. Uh, in, this, uh, in this process, the new password will be updated in the cache credentials entry, which we saw last slide. Uh, something interesting to note about this um, procedure, and it's actually crucial for our attack, is that this process does not require the computer account key. It only requires the user key. All right, so we've learned about network authentication and local authentication. So what an attacker uh, might do? He can take, uh, may, uh, set up his own DC, a rogue DC, with the same domain name. This domain can be easily found by looking at the UI of the computer. On the DC, he'll create a new user account, whatever account he wants, and set a password cho uh, uh, attacker chosen password. He'll then physically connect the computer, the rogue DC to the computer, and the attacker will then log in using the rogue password. But this doesn't work. This doesn't work because there isn't a trust relationship between the new rogue, the rogue DC and the victim uh, machine. Recall that um, accessing a host is actually accessing a service in Kerberos, in our case, the target, uh, the target machine. Since the rogue DC does not have the computer account key, he cannot, the ticket cannot be validated. And that, that's the reason that this naive attack does not work. So Ian's attack, is uh, sort of a revision of this attack. Uh, what he did was set up a new uh, rogue DC. The password is chosen by the attacker, but the user is um, the same user as, as the user that is currently logged on. The password for this user is then marked as expired. The attacker will then connect the DC to uh, the rogue DC to the target machine and enter his uh, chosen password. Since the, uh, the password is marked as expired on the DC, this will prompt a password change, which will then lead to uh, the cache credentials being poisoned with the new password. He, uh, the attacker will then disconnect the DC, and now uh, he'll enter his new attacker chosen password, which will then be calculated to a cache credential entry, checked against the cache credential entry that was poisoned, and he'll gain access to the computer. Wait. This is it. All right, so now let's look at the video again, now that we know what's going on. So the Raspberry Pi is our rogue DC, and we have the target uh, computer on the left. And now Ian will try to log on, but it doesn't work. Now the rogue DC already has the user in it and it's marked as password expired. So we'll enter his chosen, attack, uh, chosen password and we'll be prompt for a change password, choose a different password and change it. Cache credentials have been poisoned. We'll now disconnect the rogue DC and log on with the new password which will then be checked against the cache credentials and log on. All right, so to sum up, this is our evil maid. Um, this is the target computer and uh, the real DC. Now, 
now the target machine has been disconnected from the real DC and, dis and connected to a rogue DC. The attacker changes the password on the computer and gains control of the computer. All right. So the main issue here is that the cache credentials get poisoned without trust being validated. So the fix was to ask for a ticket to the computer. Fix didn't work quite right, and uh, only a ticket was asked. Um, another fix for that was to actually validate the trust, and this was found by Nabil Ahmed and Tom Gillis. Uh, those couple then looked at other different parts of, um, of Kerberos that don't involve the computer uh, trust, or actually they look for processes, not just Kerberos, that don't involve computer trust. And they found that group policy, the user group policy, doesn't check for um, computer trust, for the, doesn't require the computer account key. Now, group policy has system privileges. So what they did was using the exact, exact same techniques as before, sp um, spawn a shell as a task, uh, scheduled task on the, on the attacked uh, machine, and as I said, since group policy runs a system, they have had a shell and system privileges on that tech machine, as you can see on the right. All right, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Tal to talk about our attack. Thank you, Chaim. Now we're ready for the new stuff, or the remote butler attack when the evil may met the cyber kill chain. So, very cool attack, evil made, yet it requires physical access and the harsh reality for the attackers, they often don't have physical access, but what they do often have is network access. And if we are able to take the evil made attack and transform it into the remote butler attack, which is the same, just don't require physical access, can be launched from afar from, a, from the network, it would be very beneficial for them. And let's take a look of what uh, advanced attackers are doing on their victims' uh, network. So we had divided it into three main phases. The, the initial phase of just getting in, the attacker just getting into the network, so it starts with the network infiltration, hacking an arbitrary machine that the attacker are able to get into, and then they want to get a single set of domain credentials. Why? Because with domain credentials, they can do lateral movement, which is a big word for abusing the access that uh, these credentials, domain credentials, enable and use, the, use it to access other computers, harvest more credentials on this computer, and goes like that, so on and so forth, until they uh, uh, grab more and more credentials and finally get some of the, of the highly privileged uh, user credentials, the domain admin. When they have domain admin credentials, they basically have uh, access to every machine in the domain. They can further abuse it to gain access to the domain controller and download using uh, DC sync or functionality like that all of the keys to all of the users in the domain. And now the attacker in the end of the second stage have all keys to all door in the domain, but they are not winning yet because they still have to get uh, into the data and this is the final stage. So they make their way into the data. They have all the access they need, but they still need to find the data and exfiltrate it to their server and then attackers win. And this is where uh, this attack meets us because in Microsoft and Threat Analytics, ATA, that's what we do. We research uh, the attacker's kill chain, try to detect as many parts of it as we, as we can. And this got us thinking. We saw Ian's talk and thought, what are uh, attackers, the attackers that we research, attackers, advanced attackers that do network-based attacks, are they able to use it? And most specifically, the most uh, uh, the attacker's biggest motivation would be the initial stage, because in the initial stage, attacker has access to a non-domain joint machine, and they would like to jump into a machine that stores domain credential. But how would they do that? So if they are able to use that even-made black magic to get into the 
domain machine, it would be great. So how does it happen that uh, attacker has access to the network but don't have domain credential? So in many cases, attacker uh, hacks some internet-facing yet non-domain joint machine, for example, exploiting a web server using some kind of web application vulnerability, SQL ejection, or RFI, LFI, you name it, and gaining access to that uh, web server using a web shell, but still are uh, this machine is not part of the domain. So this is just one op opportunity for the attacker to have that kind of situation. And just to make sure and show you that it's not a theoretical attack, but it's a valid scenario, let's take a deeper look at the hacking team breach, which is not really interesting uh, from technical point of view, but what is different about it is that the attacker had published a detailed account of his doing on the network, so we know what is done and we are able to learn from it. So the attacker infiltrated the network by using some zero-day vulnerability in a network device. Then they did internal reconnaissance, passively monitoring traffic of a nearby machine and also actively scanning uh, the internal network and found out a vulnerable network storage device. And that storage device, which required no authentication, uh, also hold, uh, stored the images of a certain virtual machine, of domain machine, and the attacker was able to analyze the hard drive of these VMs and extract domain credential and then uh, really reach the goal of this initial uh, phase and able to do lateral movement in the second phase. So it's time uh, to pimp our exploit from the evil maid to the remote uh, butler. So we, on the original attack, we had log on UI view and access that require physical access. We will translate it to RDP, remote desktop protocol access. The rock DC was brought in with the Raspberry Pi. We will have it as the payload of the malware on the bridge machine. And we will replace uh, the replace of the original DC with rock DC was done with a physical network cable. We would have to use some routing manipulation, network manipulation for that. And there is an additional problem which is not strictly technical, but but in the evil made, it could be that the, this is the final stage of the attack. Of the attack, the attacker is able to dump afterwards the computer. Maybe secrecy is not so important, but. In our case, in the advanced attacker case, it's very important because this is just the beginning of the attacker's campaign. Even if, if this attack is uh, successful by itself, yet it leads to discovery of the campaign, the attacker lose because it's very initial stage. They didn't get the data they wanted and they got discovered. So it's very important for advanced attacker to remain stealthy uh, with this uh, attack and we'll discuss it. So let's get to the details. Uh, attackers start by breaching a non-domain joint machine on the internal network, just as it happened in the hacking team case. Attacker installs the needed ROG DC functionality on the breach machine. It doesn't have to be a phone fully blown domain controller. It just needs to support certain uh, functionalities, the change password and keyboard authentication. For example, attacker may use uh, Ian's uh, Blue Box uh, project on GitHub. Check this out. And then the, uh, the attacker need to scan for potentially victims. So what are the attacker's uh, potential victims? They need to have RDP access, and attackers can check for it using MMAP scan on the relevant port, 3389. And also, they need to find machines that see their traffic so they can manipulate it and answer uh, queries to the DC on behalf of the DC with the ROG. DC. Uh, so they scan the network actively and passively and find such target. It's also helpful uh, to make sure that the user is not currently active on the machine as accessing uh, RDP concurrently with the user may cause one of, a, one of the session not to succeed, so to succeed and uh, kick the other user. So Again, not uh, something that the attacker wants, but they can uh, so they can check for it from traffic or just wait till it's very late at night or very early in the morning. Okay, so attackers have everything; they, they did all the setup. It's time to attack. 
attackers hijack the victim machine, traffic to the DC. This can be done. We have done it with our poisoning, our spoofing, which is uh, Hackers 101, but there might be a lot of other ways to do it using DNS poisoning, LLMNR, NBNS, or just answering before the original DC with no man in the middle, just men on the side. And if someone wants to explore it and tell me the results, I'll be happy to hear. And then the, once the attacker has a connectivity with the ROG DC uh, to their target machine, they connect via RDP to that machine, configure the ROG DC accordingly to the UI or based on the traffic on the correct domain name and also the username needed for the evil maid, perform the evil maid attack, trigger uh, password change, and uh, using that uh, uh, and causes the cache credential to be poisoned, then uh, stop answering from the rock DC, <coughs> causing a, a, a local uh, cache credential logon with their po with the attacker control password. The attacker gets in, takes over. If needed, now the attacker can escalate to local administrator administrator using the ROG group policy attack that Chaim had shown. Then the attacker is able to dump the domain credential for memory of the original user, and we will talk about that because it's a little bit surprising. We changed the original user password. How come uh, his keys are still in memory? And now the attacker can return uh, whenever they want to this computer because they have already the domain credentials. And without having any uh, RAT, any remote access tool, the attacker are able to return to that computer. And also they had achieved a domain credential, which was their goal for this uh, stage. So let's talk about uh, extracting, the attacker extracting keys from memory. And it appears that even this is the regular behavior of password change. It, it, when you change password, you can test it in your own environment using Mimikatz. Uh, the old password keys remains in LSASS memory, and I hope you can see that in the screenshot on the left-hand side. You can see that for the same session, there are two NTLM keys exist for the same session. One corresponds to the older password, which was ABC123 ABC, and the second it corresponds to the attacker's new password password, which is B. Okay, now let's discuss cleanup, because we said it's very important for the attacker to remain stealthy. Uh, so for most cases, attackers doesn't have to do don't have to do anything. They just reroute back the target computer into the original DC. And as we said, it happened very late at night. In the morning when the user comes in, the user doesn't know that something had happened, so they would input their normal password, and uh, the DC, original DC, again, doesn't know something bad has happened, nothing changed there, so it, it sees that original password, compared it to the password that, he, that the DC has, and authenticate the user, and when the, uh, so the authentication is successful, and the cache credential gets updated because the cache credential says, oh, this is a hash that is different than what I have in my cache credential store. So uh, it updates the cache credential store and everything goes back to normal. But it's not good enough for the attacker because there is a possibility, maybe a remote possibility, that the user will come in the morning and instead of logging in uh, to his machine, he, they would take the machine to some meeting that, that they have and they don't have a DC connectivity there, so lo cache credentials logon would be performed and the user won't be able to access their computer because uh, the cache credential was poisoned with the attacker control password that the user doesn't know, and then the user might go to uh, IT and say, there's something wrong with my computer, and which may, might lead to the discovery of the attacker. So attacker needs to take care of it. And to take care of it, let's recall that cache credential, the only secret ingredient in the cache credential hash is the MD4 of the password. And let's recall that MD4 of the password is actually anti-hash. Wait a minute, anti-hash, we just extracted it from memory, the attackers just extracted it. So attackers have all the ingredients 
most importantly, the MD4 hash, which is the NTLM hash, but also the username, of course, which is not a secret. And they also don't need to code because this functionality is already uh, present in the Mimikatz tool. So just input the NTLM hash and the username, and Mimikatz will take care of it and update the cache credential store for the attacker. So I think this is a good time to see that uh, live. So, Chaim, the stage is yours. All right, thank you. Don't need this. All right, so um, let's do a demo. All right, so our scenario is that we have a victim machine, in our case, um, this VLAB Win 10. And uh, it has a real DC. And we'll set up a rogue DC and an attacker. Our attacker will be a Kali Linux uh, machine. Now, I just want to log in here and make sure that everything works. So this is the original password, abc123, abc. And he logs on, all right? So he locks the computer and goes home, for example. All right. So in our case, where is our? machine. All right. So I hope you can see. Um, this is the attacker. So the attacker will first scan for all RDP ports on the network. And he found uh, one machine, this machine with an open RDP port, and he can remote desktop to it Uh, to see the username and the domain name. So in, uh, in this situation, he has everything that he needs in order to set up a rogue DC. He needs the domain name and he needs the, the username to set up uh, the user. So uh, for this gem demonstration, we'll do the routing manipulation by uh, enabling and disabling uh, adapters because it demonstrates better what's going on. So this is our DC. and um, We'll perform the routing manipulation. We'll just disable this adapter and enable it on our rogue DC. So now all traffic is routed to the rogue DC. Uh, in our case, this DC is just a regular domain controller, but it can be uh, something smaller. All right, so we'll create a new user. It's user2 and user2. And the password will be A, and must change password at next logon. All right. Now, going back to our attacker. So we'll connect to the user with our uh, password. And we're prompted to change the password. So we'll change it to B. and the password has been changed. And uh, at this stage, we want to simulate the disconnection of the DC or the stopping of all traffic. So we'll just disable the adapter, not this one, on the rogue DC, and perform the password change. Where is it? Okay. Now, this takes a while because uh, the machine will try and connect to a DC. It will time out. It will try again. It will time out. This might take a while. Um, it's important to note that this vulnerability has been patched uh, <laughs> in the end of 2015. Uh, but up until the patch, it worked on all versions of Windows. Maybe it's a good time to take some questions if there are while we're waiting. It, it will take a minute, <laughs> but we try to keep it real and do a, a real Good demo. Night. So, if there are, any... oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, meanwhile, we managed to log on. Do you want to answer the question? Uh, let's take the question. So uh, it really changed. Well, the root cause of all this uh, problem is that uh, uh, the domain trust is not validated. 
it's not validated that the computer is uh, the computer does not mutually uh, authenticate that this is a real DC talking uh, to it. And by changing the way that group policy is now uh, done from the computer context and not from the user context, it uh, it requires the trust to be validated. So now the trust is validated, and this attack no longer works. So great question. So let's proceed. All right. So now uh, the attacker have gained control on the machine. Now, just to demonstrate that the uh, first um, the original password doesn't work. I'm going to log off and try and log on with the original password. All right, so I'm going to log off and log on again. So recall that the original password was ABC123 ABC. And this shouldn't work. So we'll have to wait a while. So maybe it's time for another question. <laughs> oh, yeah, what? Lucian. So, oh. And it didn't work. Next All right. Time. So entering the attacker chosen one, which was B, logs on. All right. So the cache credentials have been poisoned, and the user can't connect with his original uh, password. Now, what we'll do is we'll, uh, the attackers will grab the credentials. So we'll um, reconnect our DC and... I already opened a share there for, here it is, Rogue DC share, which conveniently has Mimikatz on it. And we'll run it as administrator. Um, so in the demo, the user is uh, an administrator, but as we've seen before, we can just uh, do privilege escalation to get to system. All right, so... All right, so now we'll grab the hashes. Um, and this is our users. And as you can see, this is the new uh, NTLM hash, and this is the old one. So we'll grab the old hash, just mark it. All right. And now we'll replace the cache credentials. We'll do the uh, cleanup. So in order to do that, we have to have system privileges. All right. And now let's just, let's just take a look at the cache. All right. So this is our MS cache v2. And now we'll just enter our ingredients, which is the user and the NTLM, which we just grabbed. And the, ca the cache has been uh, replaced. All right. So the attacker cleaned up. He has the user credentials. He'll delete Mimikatz and log off. And now I want to dem demonstrate uh, the scenario where the user comes into the office and takes his laptop um, but isn't connected to the domain controller. So this is... So we'll just disconnect our rogue DC. So now the, um, the machine is not connected to anything. Where is it? Here it is. And this is the user trying to enter his original password, not connected to any DC. Again, it will try to look for uh, a DC. We'll time out and we'll eventually go to the cache credentials, which we just cleaned up. And voila, we uh, cleaned up. Now, just uh, um, just to show you that if we connect it to the back to the domain controller, it still works. I'll enable the domain controller. Enter the original password, and we're connected. And the final stage is that. Uh, since we grabbed the hashes, we can now perform, for example, a pass the hash attack. So let's just copy this. And let's do who am I? User true running on VLAB1. And the attacker can do whatever he wants from here on. All right. Well, 
it's exciting for me to see it every time. And uh, okay. thank you, fine. And thank you for the demo gods for allowing all this to happen. Yeah, it's very stressful, you know, having a live demo. And so I appreciate you, Chaim, for doing it. So let's sum up. So we had the evil made attack, which required some physical access. The attacker steps up to the attacked computer, brings a rock DC, connects it to the computer, triggers a change password, poisons the cache credential, and gets in. In the evil remote butler, the attacker penetrates the network, installs the rock DC on uh, the bridge machine, manipulates traffic so DC traffic uh, comes to its machine, and then triggers a change password, poison the cache credential, gets in, extract uh, NTLM hashes, restores everything to be normal. So we had seen that this at remote butler attack is very much relevant for the first phase of the attacker initial phase to go from network connectivity to domain credentials, but it's also relevant for the second stage. Now that the attacker has domain credentials, they are able to do further reconnaissance, uh, te- reconnaissance attack to find out where the uh, privileged user uh, reside, where the log on, and we understand, realize that uh, as a byproduct of our attack, well, it, the attacker can use RDP reconnaissance for that, just uh, RDP connect to any machine, to every machine, and see which users are currently logged on, specifically where are the admins logged on. So in fact, the whole uh, cycle of the lateral movement can be realized just using a remote butler. For admin reconnaissance, the attacker might use RDP reconnaissance. For remote code execution, the remote butler uh, is there to escalate local privileges, rug group policy update, and to compromise credential, mimicat from memory. And of course, it can be mixed and match with existing lateral movement uh, techniques. So let's talk about defense. So first of all, install patches. This is a partial list of man-in-the-middle related attacks and patches in Windows. Man-in-the-middle DC, domain controller man-in-the-middle, not general man-in-the-middle attacks. So uh, at least six patches, three related to evil made, one, two are related to the jazz bug, which is another man-in-the-middle attack against world policy. If you attended Sean Matkalf, talk the other day, it talked about it, so you might want to see it uh, afterwards in the video, and also the bedlock, the infamous bedlock, uh, which is a man-in-the-middle attack against uh, RPC. So, patch, 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 is, especially if you thought that maybe you thought even made it's not so important to patch, because it required physical access, no, it can be done also from a remote access. So if you haven't patched that, if you deprioritize it, go back home and patch. Let's talk about hardening. There are two protocols in this attack, RDP and Kerberos, and both can be hardened to mitigate this attack. So RDP hardening can be done with NLA, network level authentication, which really moves the, changes the order of things and move authentication up front. So a, a user needs to pay uh, their authentication up front and prove that they are able to authenticate. And this way, the attack is mitigated because the attacker cannot prove is able to, they are able to access the machine because they can't. That's why they're doing the attack. And the uh, Kerberos armoring. Kerberos armoring, just, uh, the que- it relates to the question, uh, to the previous question from the crowd. The root cause of all the, of this problem is that uh, uh, someone forgot to check for uh, domain trust. And Kerberos Armoring bakes trust into Kerberos. And in fact, everything, all the user authentication is now depends on the computer previous authentication. So specifically, Kerberos errors get uh, signed with the computer session key. And so the attacker can no longer fake errors such as to trigger a Kerberos password change. Uh, because the attacker don't have the computer key and unable to properly sign it. And even if they were able to sign it, they would fail in the next phase because the uh, Kerberos uh, 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 authentication to change the password would fail because it depends on knowing the computer key too. So 
if you can, please apply Kerberos Armoring, and you can see in the screenshot on the bottom, there is highlighted the encrypted part in the Kerberos error under uh, Kerberos uh, Armoring. And this is a feature that's available since Windows 8 service, Server 2012, and also backward compatible, so you can also work with it with Windows 7, and it doesn't break Windows 7, or at least allegedly. Uh, and finally, defense in depth. Uh, so this is kind of more philosophical advice uh, because you might say, okay, this is for this specific attack. You, you, you have all kind of patches and hardening. How I, I'm going to defend against all that in advance when I'm not aware of such attack? So we've seen that the Reva model for the attacker is the cyber kill chain. So it's kill. It's kind of scary, but it's chain. And chain is also is only as strong as its weakest link. So if we, as defenders, deploy a solution that uh, detects all the different steps, so even if the attacker is able to bypass uh, our defenses and come up with new new attack that we are not aware of, we will catch it on the other steps. So do that. So let's conclude. What are, was our new contribution? We've seen, we've seen uh, Ian Hacken original attack, but made it fit to advanced attacker scenario by addressing access over RDP, rock DC as a malware payload, rock DC connection with routing manipulation, do compromising domain credential with Mimikat, and a stealthy cleanup there to restore the cache credential. Additional contribution that can be used outside of the context of the remote butler is the RDP reconnaissance attack vector, and the defense of applying Kerberos armory, which defeats also the original uh, rock DC even made attack. Takeaways. So local even made is very cool, but remote butler is also cool, but very practical. Rock DC, as we've seen there, many patches for that are vast and relevant, so you should be afraid of it. And solutions are patching, hardening, defense and depth, and final slide, some thank yous to Ian Hacken for the inspiration and the contribution to this work, Benjamin DP, Mimikat author from Mimikat, and also for a useful comment, and Tom Gillis, uh, one of the uh, researchers mentioned here, for uh, he did a review on our talk too. Uh, to Microsoft ATA researchers that are not here today, it graded Tamo, which computer contributed to this uh, research, and finally to our designer, Tamo Design Tamo, with uh, the uh, nice infographics. So, with that, questions? Yeah, please. Well, uh, no, because even uh, though the question was, would BitLocker uh, help? And BitLocker does not help, and this is, was, in fact, the motivation for Ian's original attack to bypass Bit, BitLockers, because you are able to log on. You're not taking the computer uh, out of the, the, taking the hard drive outside of the computer and mounting it in another place. What would work is the boot, uh, if the attacker, if the machine needs, has a BitLocker password on before, Ian Hacken attack wouldn't work. But our attack would work because uh, in most cases, computer remains online. Let's say this is a server and remains online. So it, it has only Windows log on to it and not a BitLocker log on to, to it. We, we, don't, we are not restarting, we are not powering up and down the computer, so we won't be prompted for a BitLocker. So it, it doesn't help uh, to our attack. Any more questions? Yes, please. So there's another uh, comment, uh, maybe refer to him to say the other mitigations. Any more questions? So thank you all for coming here today. We appreciate your time. Thank you.